uh, it is now 6.30, so let's get started. Um, and uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's Zoom seminar on, on what's happening in Fukuoka and Hokkaido. My name is Eric Johnston. I'm the senior national well, editor for the Japan Times and uh, a member of FCCJ since 2000. I am also based in the Kansai region. So like most of you participating tonight, I actually don't live in Tokyo. Um, we've got uh, a number of things we'd like to do tonight, but I want to first introduce our two speakers and uh, just tell you a little bit about them. Um, we, are, uh, we have two speakers. Uh, one is from Hokkaido. She is Delena Miyazaki. She's a 20-year resident of Hokkaido, and she's the inspiration behind the very interesting Anything Goes Hokkaido podcast series. It spotlights Sapporo and the Hokkaido foreign community. And for those of you who have traveled around Sapporo, uh, you might have recognized her voice on various uh, subway and train stations. She's the recorded English voice for JR Bus, Hokuto Bus, Sapporo Art Park, the Sapporo Snow Festival, and uh, Hokkaido University, uh, among uh, many projects she's done. She's also done voiceover recording for NHK and video narration for J.A. Obihiro. And her television work includes appearances on TV Tokyo and NTV as well as on the USTEAM program, Ibesa Hokkaido. So she'll be talking about her uh, life in Hokkaido and what it's like to work in the English language, indeed have your own English language media organization there. The, then we go all the way down to Kyushu, to, to Fukuoka, where Nick Sazans, and apologies, Nick, if I mangled uh, the, the pronunciation of your last name. Uh, Nick is originally from Toronto, and he is the owner and publisher of Fuku Fukuoka Now, a multilingual magazine, website, social media, and video creator. He's the chairperson of the Fukuoka International Business Association, a cool Japan ambassador, and a recipient of the Fukuoka Culture Prize. In January of this year, Nick launched Kyushu Live on YouTube channel while sharing live stream narrated walks around Kyushu. And later this month, his company will launch Itoshima Now, a website dedicated to the seaside area just outside Fukuoka, where he lives. Of course, we have many FCCJ members who are very familiar with Hokkaido and uh, Fukuoka and get down there on a regular basis. And we have, I think, a lot of interest in general among our membership about what is going on down there. Before we turn over tonight's presentation to Delaina and Nick, though, uh, we are joined by FCCJ President Suvendrini Kakuchi, who would like to now say a few words about the club and what we're doing. Suvendrini, the mic is yours. Thanks, Eric. Hi, everybody. I'm, um, as Eric said, I'm the president this year of uh, the Foreign Correspondence Club of Japan. Um, I welcome you all there. Anytime you're there uh, in, in Tokyo, do dro drop by. Uh, the uh, club has, um, as you know, has a long history. And um, we started out uh, in um, just after World War II, uh, when uh, General Douglas MacArthur decided that Japan should have free speech. And in brief, uh, this is where foreign correspondents got together to report on Japan um, just after the war, and then also on the Korean War that followed uh, soon after. So we have a very um, long and lofty um, brand. Um, of course, life has changed very much in Japan. It's safe. It's uh, we've uh, got a great economy going, and um, we've uh, have a journalist now from um, all over the world. I'm from Sri Lanka, by the way, but I've been living in Japan for thirty years, more than half my life. So I'm covering Japan, Asia, and I cover development news, which is why I'm very supportive of this diversity panel where we have uh, different opinions and a variety of uh, views. Um, we have also um, the uh, press conferences, which is uh, really our identity. We continue to invite um, important speakers, plus uh, speakers that cannot speak at other venues in Japan. So we have uh, quite a lot of uh, open um, discussion and encourage speakers who have uh, been doing their various projects in uh, various parts of Japan, as we have now from Fukuoka now and uh, Delina. 
what else can I say, Eric, except that um, I think the media is changing, as we all know. And I'm hoping during my tenure to have the press hub as a source of uh, important debate on where the media should go from now on, the importance of freedom of speech and um, the importance of getting um, diverse journalists from Asia, small countries, big countries where we can sit together. So I uh, welcome you to become, um, it's called the ex canto membership, I think. We are most welcome to join us in this important debate of the future of journalism and um, and the role we can play in developing Japan in, in its global context. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sivandrini, much appreciated. So um, next I'd like to uh, ask uh, Ilgen Yomalas, who is my co-chair on the diversity committee to say a few words. Ilgen. Hi, hello everyone. Can you hear me? Great, thank you. Um, I am originally from Turkey and I work for BBC World Turkish. Um, I came to Japan first in 1995 to Niigata and uh, to a very small village called Urasa, which is almost like an Inaka place. Uh, so I very much appreciate local news and uh, what goes on beyond Tokyo. Um, I know that recently, especially with the COVID pandemic, we are seeing more and more uh, people going back to their hometowns, the U-turn. And so very happy tonight to have uh, two people, Delina and Nick, uh, reporting from um, Hokkaido and Fukuoka respectively. I also want to say a few words about uh, diversity committee. Uh, we were set up in 2020. It's a very new committee. Uh, Eric and I co-chair it. Um, we looked at our membership, the FCCJ membership, and uh, saw that mm, basically um, only 15 to 20% of our members were what we call the underrepresented groups, uh, meaning women, under 40 students and non-Japanese Asians. So we are primarily trying to diverse our membership, diverse, uh, diversify our membership, diversify our speakers, and um, to make sure that we have people um, from different backgrounds coming to speak or becoming members. Um, last year, we had uh, quite a successful uh, series of um, press events, including, uh, but not limited to the uh, LDP lawmakers, uh, Seiko Noda, as you know, uh, she actually ran for uh, the presidentship of LDP. Um, we also had um, <clears throat> SMAP's um, Suyoshi Kusanagi, who came to speak at FCCJ and we were bombarded by the SMAP fans. I believe the video um, racked about 400,000 views as of now uh, to speak about LGBTQ. Um, we had disabled MPs coming and speak at, uh, at our venue. Um, and also just as, as Drini was saying, plain, um, you know, just ordinary people, ordinary women who just want to keep their surnames, just you know, very simple as that. Um, so simple as that to something more complex like abortion, for example, uh, right. Um, and we also had, uh, thanks to Eric again, uh, foreign media in Japan, past, uh, present and future, that webinar. But we also realize, realize that it's not just about um, the gender or age or ability, but geography that we have to diversify, which is why it's crucial to meet and uh, listen to um, people like uh, Delena and Nick. So I'm very much looking forward to the conversation tonight. Uh, I'm here at FCCJ and I'm welcoming everyone online and also our guests. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you, Elgin, much appreciated. Yes, indeed, we are ge geographically diverse tonight. We have people tuning in from Hokkaido, from Kyushu, I myself am in uh, Nara Prefecture. And uh, on geographical diversity, I should just like to mention that we've actually got 35 members here in the Kansai region. 
So we're always looking to expand and we're in the age of remote now, um, it's easier than ever before. So um, with that, I think I'd like to begin. And uh, if it's okay, the first person we hear from is Delena. So I believe she has a Google uh, Power of Google presentation with slides with us. So uh, Delena, take it away. Okay, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. So I'm Delena Miyake. I reside in Sapporo. I have been here exactly 20 years and a few months. And I'm originally from Indiana and Florida in America. So I'm just a small town girl <laughs> myself in many ways. And uh, as you mentioned, Eric, uh, you can hear my voice on more than half of the public transportation here in Sapporo and Hokkaido and other areas that I'm not allowed to talk about <laughs> uh, because of NDAs, but I'm most well known for the next stop is Sapporo Station. <laughs> Thank you for riding JR Hokkaido today. So the JR trains, as well as buses and many other places, you can hear me loud and clear and everywhere. So um, besides narration work, uh, I have a few things that I do and I'd like to share my screen now to give you a taste of what Hokkaido is to me. Okay, here we go. So uh, back when the pandemic first uh, became very real and serious thing. And I realized that all of my work performing as a musician, as well as a reporter for travel shows was just out the door. I decided to start this Anything Goes Hokkaido podcast. And it was a very organic kind of experience. I went on to social media and asked if uh, anyone would be interested in being my co-host. And a young half, half as we say, um, Australian and Japanese, a uh, millennial, someone who was about half my age, raised their hand and we began this project together. Um, first of all, this was taken just a few days ago. And I think I need to move this so you can see everything a little more clearly. So this is a very not so well-known park, not far from my home, the Hiraoka Tree Art Center. Uh, I came here on this day and recorded a music video uh, for a special presentation for the Association of Foreign Wives to Japanese, of which I'm a member. Uh, that group also has a 50 year history and I'm currently the Hokkaido representative for that group. So um, besides narration and the podcast, I am also a musician. So this is a concert I have coming up on Sunday in Takikawa, which is just south of Asahikawa. Uh, this is my second show to perform live since the COVID pandemic began, so I'm very excited to be getting back into this. Uh, before COVID, I was doing a program for the New Chitose Airport called Have Fun in Hokkaido. Uh, this is our first episode. I did nine in total seasonally over the course of two plus years. Uh, this was in Otaru, and here in the center we have a Furano Asahikawa, famous for ramen. And the thing that I love, of course, the food, nature, um, everything is amazing. But for me, uh, the people that I got to meet really uh, have touched my heart. And it's kind of where I'd like to talk tonight in a little bit. But first, just a, another little taste of Hokkaido. This is the Tomamu Unkai Terrace. Uh, you can maybe catch the sea of clouds one out of three days, if you're lucky, uh, rising at about four, well, three in the morning, three thirty in the morning to leave the hotel, <laughs> and go up the uh, ropeway at about four o'clock. We had a very nice view this day. Uh, this Tomamu bus is another place you can hear my voice, <laughs> just coincidentally. Uh, we went filming in Hakodate, which of course has a famous night view. Um, so many wonderful experiences doing this work. Lake Mashu on a rare, clear day. Uh, this was our second filming. We went to Doto or Eastern Hokkaido. And I got to work with a dairy farmer, uh, feeding the cows and milking cows and getting licked by cows for hours <laughs> on the first day. Um, it was a good thing I had a spare change of clothes that look exactly the same. 
uh, here on Daebun Island, which you might know Rishiri and Daebun are the most northern islands of the country. This is the Momo Iwa Observatory. Looks very much like maybe Ireland or another kind of fairy tale country. It's a bit late in the season, but if you go in the summer, this is known as the floating island of flowers because you can see alpine flowers um, at a very low altitude, which is kind of rare. This is also on Rebun, uh, the praying hands rock. You can maybe see these two rocks here. If you get closer, they actually have a very clear split between them and look like hands together. Um, nice story about when we, when I took this picture, you can't see them, but there was a couple sitting off um, taking photos and it was beautiful sunset and I walked past them to get some pictures myself. And on my way back, I just said hello and they turned out to be from Singapore. And uh, did you get nice pictures? Oh, yes, we did. And I just proposed to her and it was amazing. But it turns out that they had taken the last bus to get to this beach. And uh, there were no buses running and they asked me for help to see if I could maybe get a taxi. So I called three taxi companies and they were each in turn like, it's after 5 p.m., are you crazy? <laughs> That's too far away, <laughs> no way. So uh, my camera crew and I were able to give them a lift into town and it was a very nice experience, uh, which, the connection to Singapore, I'm currently working on a project with the Hokkaido government um, to promote tourism to Singapore. This photo was taken two weeks ago on a real salmon fishing boat. And if you can see the person in the white hat, that is me in the middle of a rainstorm um, for about three, three and a half hours, starting at four in the morning or so. But this particular group of people, um, they are the heart of Hokkaido to me. These hardworking fishermen and farmers and entrepreneurs throughout the land that are often living in towns that are dying because um, young people are moving to the cities. It's very hard to continue on this generational work, very hard work. The salmon fishermen in particular, the catch has not been anything like it was in recent years. So they're looking to expand to tourism to help increase their business. Um, speaking of tourism, here in Erimo, which if you look at the map of Hokkaido, it's not Hakodate southernmost, but in the center, you have the southernmost tip. So that is where we are. The Cape Erimo is right there at that tip. And uh, kombu boats, who uh, usually are fishing, harvesting kombu, they are offering cruises and uh, you can take a very spirited ride uh, sitting on what feels like maybe apple crates or something not quite so stable. Um, we had a nice little short jaunt just to catch some film. Uh, again, me and my white hat because it's a bit breezy and chilly. If you're lucky and the weather cooperates, you can even go straight to the Cape Erimo tip and see harbor seals uh, very close. We were not able to do it that day, but uh, it was still nice weather for us. Then um, this is one of the government officials working in Urakawa Cho, Mr. Nakagawa. He's, uh, used to be a tour guide in New Zealand. So we had a nice time speaking English together on the program, and he was my guide for this particular show. We went to Izami Sushi, and uh, the story with the sushi master chef is that uh, he's been in a commercial in Southeast Asia and whenever customers come, they wanna take their picture with him because in their eyes, he's quite famous. And uh, it really brought to mind how powerful celebrity and the social media can be. So it was a lovely, lovely experience. Here he is making a ginsei salmon nigiri, which ginsei is a type of salmon you can only get in the Hidaka area. And uh, there's a lot of points and factors that the government has decided make it ginsei, but part of it is size, coloring. Uh, the most important part is when you cook it, it tends not to flake apart, but to stay quite nice together. And uh, <laughs> the chirashi sushi, of course, was a delicious highlight. Sometimes I have trouble believing I get to eat these kind of things for a living. <laughs> 
Uh, so the next morning, this is um, the fish salmon fishing boat. We were there uh, leaving, leaving the hotel about 3.30 in the morning on the boat by 4.15 or so, raining the entire time. I am having a very good time uh, pulling up the fishing net with them. I was very impressed with the whole endeavor. And uh, sorting the salmon later was really a lot of fun. I, I love this picture because the flying salmon has such a comical look on its face. And uh, after we got dried off, I do not like this picture of myself, but it does give you the appropriate reaction to having an entire bowl of salmon roe presented to you. Um, they offer a breakfast after the tour where you can eat all you can eat salmon roe and a Hokkaido specialty of uh, chan chan yaki, which is salmon and local vegetables like cabbage and onions, potatoes, carrots, and a miso mixture cooked together over this nice open grill. And this is the Sakamoto Brothers Fishing Company. Uh, this is one of the Sakamoto Brothers. You can see he's got a very gregarious face and nature about him. He does not really speak English, but he'll make you think he does until you finally catch him in a question that is obviously not computing. Um, we really had a great time with all of the crew. Uh, they were just lovely people. And I could not finish my salmon row for the life of me as much as I love it. And it seemed sacrilege to throw it away. So I asked if I might be able to take this uh, home with me. And they said, oh, there's no need to do that, you know here, let, would you like some to take home? And they brought me two new containers of frozen salmon roe and wrapped them up in the nice polyester container for me. So there was no way to share with my coworkers. So sorry. And I just thought to myself, well, I want to see your freezer, what you've got in there. You could have sold salmon roe to any of us. We would have bought it gladly. Um, I want to see what's on the second floor of this gorgeous wooden fisherman's house and uh, things that I just have these ideas popping all the time about how they could improve their tourism, especially when the weather is not cooperating. However, the fact that we went on the boat tour in the rain really impressed me because most of the time when you're traveling, if you have bad weather, you're out of luck. But in this case, still being able to go was a really incredible experience. Um, also on a shoot about a week before this uh, in the Funkan Bay area or the Hashiko United, it's about five cities that have come together um, along going down towards Hakodate. Um, we were at the Imakane Wagyu farm and uh, they're very proud about how everything from the feed to, to the animals, they're all raised there locally from start to finish. And um, I listened to this farmer talk quite a lot. And it uh, seems that he feels there's not enough support or ability to really advertise the quality of what they have to offer. And he made a comment that, well, if Matsuko Deluxe would do a commercial about eating Wagyu, it would absolutely sell. And I thought to myself, I'm not Matsuko Deluxe, but perhaps I could be one of the faces of Hokkaido to help people that need advertising or some kind of celebrity. So I feel all the more motivated to break into season two of the podcast, which has been on a bit of a hiatus since my co-host moved away, and to also continue uh, touring with music and uh, just spread the love around Hokkaido. This was also from a uh, shoot. This is Toyota, the Toyota Berry Farm. Um, one of the most gorgeous spreads I've ever seen of fresh Hokkaido shika venison and Toyota pork, which is uh, renowned. Also, the Toyota strawberries are quite famous. And um, the I don't have a picture of him, but the owner of this farm and restaurant actually moved to this town because they have the only Schneider school in Hokkaido. And uh, the governor in Toyota begged a Schneider School to come and set up in the town. So it's another unique thing that I would love to showcase on the podcast. So this is my last slide. Uh, this was the team that I worked with for these three projects from Wakanai 
the Funkabe area and Hidaka over the last two months. Um, these two work in a three-man team of advertising and travel. Of course, with COVID, they've really had to switch focus. So um, absolutely love the way they've been pulling their business together and doing these projects that are forward thinking towards bringing currently the Singapore audience to Hokkaido. And uh, this freelance videographer, uh, he is originally from Osaka, but has been in Hokkaido for about four years, uh, backpacked around the world and worked in Canada for a year before beginning his company. And they were just an absolute pleasure and delight to work with um, one of the best experiences I've had. And next month, we will be going back to Wakanai to do a live webinar for Singapore, presenting the video that we did for the Wakanai Sorofutsu area. And I'll stop sharing. So I think I've still got a couple of minutes to present. I thought I would share one more thing. Um, I worked on this for a while over the past week. So um, now the Anything Goes Hokkaido podcast is available in audio and video form. So this is our Podbean website where you can go and uh, listen to the episodes. We're also should be available on Spotify and most of the streaming platforms. I am known as the voice of Sapporo <laughs> due to all my endeavors around here. And this is from a commercial that actually aired in Aomori a few years ago for a used car company. And I'm really glad it did not air in Hokkaido because I'm screaming, Kurumutaka, Kuritai! So um, also, this is the thing I have been working on. I set up a blog on uh, WordPress for the time being, and you can catch um, all of the videos and a bit of more information in some cases. And I'm intending to blog more, for example, about local food and businesses and different things as I get the chance. So if you would like to take a look at that, I would be so grateful. And we are currently looking for sponsors who would be interested in sponsoring the podcast and or having professionally narrated commercials for your business in Hokkaido or further abroad. So thank you so much for your time. I look forward to answering your questions uh, when we get around to that section. And that's all for me for today. Thank you so much, Delena. Very, very interesting. I especially liked your trip on the salmon boat. I, I, I would love to actually hop on a salmon boat myself and uh, go fishing. My problem is, is I probably end up eating half of uh, what is supposed to be filmed. So uh, I'm going to get kicked off the boat. But thank you so much. And now uh, let's go to Nick down in Fukuoka, who I believe also has a presentation. Nick, the mic is yours. OK. Um, would you like me to throw a question to Lena's way, or, or do it great, are we time-wise? Uh, go, the... go ahead, and, and we'll uh, take questions after you're done, if that's OK. OK, all right. OK, all right. Then I'll get into my presentation then. Um, good evening, everybody, and uh, nice to meet you all. And uh, yeah, I will, I'll just share my screen, and we'll get into this right away. OK, hopefully. Can you see my screen? It's OK. It's it. All right, excellent. OK, well, um, I've also been in Japan quite a while. I, I don't even count anymore, but uh, over 30 years and uh, most of it in in Fukuoka. However, I, I did spend some time in Tokyo and Osaka as well, too. And speaking of Fukuoka, that is my main topic. Uh, tonight for you to just talk about Fukuoka and uh, my career in media. Uh, in Fukuoka. And basically, my mission has always been just, you know, talking about the city that I've lived in so long and, and love so much and, and think deserves more uh, spotlight or attention from other parts of Japan or the world for that matter. And this one photo that I'm showing right here, I think says a lot. Maybe this is all you need to see uh, for, for my presentation. This is a shot of uh, central Fukuoka, and you can see there's some a beautiful park in the foreground. There's residences, there's office buildings, there's entertainment facilities, the dome, hotels, tower. And in the background, we have the coast. We have a, you can't see it, but there's a beach there and some uh, island, island parks as well there. 
So, I mean, this one photo just shows what a livable and uh, comfortable uh, urban environment uh, within Foucault, within Japan uh, that Fukuoka offers. So I'm going to come back to talking about this, but the, uh, the main theme is Fukuoka offers great quality of life. Uh, and so we'll get into that. Uh, but again, the main purpose is to talk about uh, media and a bit about my background in media. Um, actually, university, thinking back to the university days, I, I did some campus radio, um, had some experience there. But when I came to Japan, when I came to Fukuoka, my first media project was a digital magazine back in 1993. And it was distributed on floppy disk. Yes, I made a magazine that was distributed on floppy disk. Like China Magazine in 1993, and that went for a, a couple of issues, uh, English and Japanese. And uh, also around that time, um, before most people had internet access at their homes anyways, from 1993, I started a um, bulletin board system, BBS. Uh, most people now won't know what that is, but um, before the internet, sort of a local area internet, I guess you could think about it. And I had members, paying members, uh, foreigners and uh, Japanese, and we had something called Bamboo Net that, that ran for several years in Fukuoka. And then my big break came when I convinced the local publisher of a town magazine, what they call it, Joho, uh, no, ma, Johoshi, this name, uh, in, Fukuoka, in Fukuoka. And that company, I said, hey, what about doing it in English language magazine? And they actually said yes. Obviously, they said yes. And for a couple of years, uh, I was the editor in, editor, editor in chief of a radar. It was called Radar, and it was Kyushu's first regularly published English language magazine. It wasn't a free paper. It was actually sold for 100 yen. And because of that company's power, it was uh, sold at convenience stores and, and bookstores and all that. And uh, yeah, it was designed actually in Toronto, Canada. Um, Anyways, that, that, the story would get long, but um, the, the background on why I'm showing this issue here is there was in 1995, there's Universiad. It's like the Olympics for universities was held in Fukuoka. And the company thought that, oh, well, maybe there is something to foreign media, even in a town like Fukuoka. But it was too far, too soon, too much too soon. And this mag's only, only considered, only continued for about two years, but I didn't give up. Um, I really loved lived in Fukuoka, and I believed in the uh, importance and necessity of having an English language uh, media in Fukuoka. So in 1998, I um, just started my own paper-based uh, free paper called Fukuoka. Now, this is a, um, uh, a photo of the first issue. And it was in just two colors, not even full color. Um, but at that size, A5 A5 size, Japanese size. Anyway, we continued publishing that until Corona, until very well, a year and a half ago or two years ago. Um, at some points, it was up to sixty pages, and uh, all advertised based, advertising based. Um, we had lots of, you know, obviously, lots of customers, and uh, yeah, lots of contents. And it was started out in English and Japanese, but we had English, Chinese, Korean. We actually had a French page, a Portuguese page, a Chinese page. There are many different variations over the twenty some years that uh, published Fukuoka now. Um, I, I also get asked to do some um, work for overseas media and uh, like CNN or whatever, and uh, domestic uh, television in HK World and also local television down here. I do some of that work as well too. But the main mission has always been Fukuoka now. And as it says here in this slide, practical and timely information on Fukuoka and Kyushu for foreigners. That's our mission. Practical, timely information. We're not an opinion magazine. We're you know, about getting out like, it's more like how to enjoy Fukuoka, how to enjoy Kyushu. Uh, that's always been our, our mission. And so, um, yeah, we published this magazine for... I might cry now, actually, because it stopped, but about uh, 20, 20 years, 20, 22 years almost. And uh, so the magazine um, looked like this. This is an uh, inside spread um, of obviously uh, gourmet, in Japanese, gourmet, um, in shokune, uh, the eating and drinking information. These are all original. These are not paid advertisements, but places that we really recommend and we would um, go and report on those and we'd have it in uh, English, Chinese and Korean. 
And that would also be on our website as well too. So that type of information, otekake joho, um, like uh, travel information, local, this is uh, a, a spread on going to Iki, which is an island just off of Fukuoka. Uh, sometimes this would be paid publicity, the local governments would pay us. Sometimes it would be actually, this is an example of a hotel in Unzen, Unzen is in Nagasaki, and uh, they would hire us. We did the drone photography I did and the photography here, that's my wife actually there, <laughs> didn't have to pay her. Um, so we, uh, we do all kinds of editorial work, um, but one of the most uh, popular parts of our contents has always been event information. Uh, foreigners um, can't read Japanese or now there's automatic translation, things have changed, but um, having the event information in English, uh, Chinese and Korean, whatever. So event information has always been really popular. Um, specials on things like um, uh, local festivals and providing making guides so people can enjoy them, um, always popular. These are like features, um, things like, and but always what's new. Um, we always had the uh, opinion that we're not just writing for, I mean, actually most of our readers are Japanese, even though it's in English. I just said there aren't as many foreigners down here in Fukuoka as, as there are in, in Tokyo, Osaka. But um, so we've always had sort of a bilingual sort of approach. And actually, even if we write in English, Japanese people read us because they like to have a foreigner's take on their own area. But anyways, we do have uh, features like that. So in 2009, I'm gonna speed things up here. Sorry, I hope I'm not speaking too fast, but in 2009, that's when um, the inbound boom actually really started. And specifically in Fukuoka, that is when a cruise ship started calling on Fukuoka. And even now, well, not now because of the pandemic, but Fukuoka has always been the, the, the highest um, in terms of volume of cruise ship calls and, and passengers. Anyways, I saw that and thought, hey, what do those people need? They need a map. So I started producing, this is actually very large. It's A1, A1 size, very large piece of paper printed on both sides and has a detailed a trilingual map of Fukuoka City and sponsored by advertisements around the side. So we had that. So our magazine and our map were distributed at over 500 locations around Fukuoka, um, hotels and information places on that. Obviously, we've had a, a website since the very beginning, and our website now has about 140,000 page views per month, and uh, it has well, it just has a lot. It has all our archives. It has all our information on that. We also, you know, do social media, of course. Um, that's where the eyeballs are. Um, Instagram, we're getting up to around 10,000 soon. And Twitter, we just put out our sort of updated links there. We don't really get involved in conversation on Twitter. Uh, Facebook, we're quite strong, about 43,000. Uh, and actually quite a bit of conversation. People leave comments. And so what we do is we post snippets of our contents that go on the web page. We post it, well, first the same time on social media, and then uh, people link into our website. That's basically our model. Um, starting in January 1st of this year, uh, during the pandemic, I thought, well, what can I do? Um, we stopped printing the, the paper magazine and the map, uh, no, no inbound tourists. So we started Kyushu Live. And Kyushu Live is sort of a virtual, uh, inroad or looking to Kyushu, not just Fukuoka, but all areas. And basically, yeah, this is the theme, exploring and connecting Kyushu. So people who want to see parts of Kyushu who can't come here, uh, people who want to connect to Kyushu can't be here. So I've done, is this working? Ah, it's coming. 77 episodes since uh, January 1st, and they're all about one hour to an hour and a half long. And basically what they are, they are live streamed narrated walks. So basically I'm walking around um, introducing an area uh, somewhere in either Fukuoka or some other city all around Kyushu, tourist attractions, events, um, sometimes like a guest on like uh, an architect and have him talk about Fukuoka architecture or public art or something like that. Uh, or we'll go to events. And this is sort of what it looks like is basically I'm holding a camera on a gimbal uh, with a microphone and giving a guide to some part of Fukuoka uh, or Kyushu. And if you go, uh, please, please go to Kyushu Live on uh, YouTube. Kyushu Live on YouTube, type that in really easy. And please subscribe 
Uh, we're getting close to 2,000. I'd love to have 2,000 subscribers by the end of the year. And uh, you can see like recently, Hakata, there's the winter illuminations. Right? I went to Peppu, which is in Oita not too long ago. On uh, Itoshima, there's an art festival or Nagasaki. So we're, we're, we're going around introducing Kyushu real time um, to people around the world, people who used to live in Kyushu, who may be moving to Kyushu, uh, who just want to see a straight that's a good thing about the live stream it's honest it's straight it's authentic uh it's not a you can't edit it so it's 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 really good i'm enjoying doing this so another thing that specifically i think for the for this group here the sccj is uh since a long time ago 2000 year 2000 that's like 20 years ago i've been making um summaries of local news uh taken from Japanese uh, local news services. This is something I'm quite proud of and, and, uh, and think is, is quite valuable. So basically what we do here is, I said, starting 2000, like 20 years ago, ah, so we have already online now, we have 8,000, over 8,800 news summaries. Um, that's a huge database of news, things that have happened in Kyushu. And we add new contents daily. And whoops. Uh, sources are local Japanese media, press releases, event information, local governments. And basically what I do is, or my, my staff as well too, is we, we select, then we summarize, and we translate, and then we find images, we, we credit everything, and we post our website, and we share these sort of headlines on our SNS, and then people read the summary on our uh, website. And you can get that if you don't want to look at our website or social media, we have a weekly newsletter. It's called The Now, and I'll introduce that later. But you can subscribe to that and keep up to date on what's happening in Fukuoka and Kyushu. And why do we do this? Well, as I used to describe Fukuoka now as a kanji buster, kanji buster. Uh, well, for people who can't read kanji, <laughs> including myself, is... Um, so we, you know, that's why we do, that's why we make Fukuoka now is because we're providing information to foreigners, people who can't read kanji, basically what it comes down to. Um, that's one thing about it. That's changed now with, with uh, machine translation. And of course, there's the Japan Times and other national um, foreign language media in Japan. However, they don't cover Kyushu and I don't think they cover Hokkaido that much. So uh, what we have done and what we still do today uh, provides those two real key, key benefits is in English, uh, summarized as well too, and it's stuff that doesn't come up in the national uh, media feed. So um, that's why the value of our Kyushu headline news. So we have a weekly newsletter and it's called The Now, and I rec recommend please subscribe to that. It's free and it looks like I, I'll click out here and we'll take a look at, at it. So it's really quite short, but it has some nice photos and then these sort of news summaries. So for example, you can read that um, Google, Google is planning to open an office in Fukuoka city. And if you click here, you get more information on that. And we credit all of our sources. We have some of our videos and event information as well too. So- All right, this, Nisha, you're, it's not coming up on the screen. Oh, there we go, there we go, sorry. Oh, it wasn't? Oh, sorry, okay, I think, Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. All right. Well, don't, I see the website didn't come through. That's all right. All right. Well, I'll continue because I still got a couple more slides to go here. The other thing that, um, of course, pushing out information is one thing, but it's the interaction with our readers. Uh, most of that, as everyone knows these days, takes place on social media. So as I said, we have a very active um, Facebook uh, page of Fukuoka now. And there, the same news that we put up on our website, of course, is there. And here, there's comments, and people will comment. They'll look at this photo and go, why aren't there any women on this team, Foucault? Why isn't there anyone under 50 years of age here? And so forth. So we get some really, heat, not heated, but lively uh, comments on our social media. Now, I'm going to switch gears now, We're talking about like what I do or what Fukuoka now does in, in uh, media down Fukuoka. But now what I want to talk about is the city itself in the area. And this is like getting back to the first photo that I showed you is I think when it comes down to it, what is Fukuoka? It's a city or area that offers a excellent quality of life. And uh, what I'm showing here is there's a British publication called Monocle 
uh, which uh, has a ranking for livability, city quality of life. And Fukuoka has, has been ranked in that for going way back, like about since they started about 12 years ago. And that was always interesting. How did Monaco find out about Fukuoka? How did they know about what I already know and what everybody who knows about Fukuoka, what a great place it is to live? How do they know? I don't know, but they knew. They, they really get Japan and, and understand, I think, where the ball is going, where things are, are going. Anyways, uh, for Fukuoka, as I say, the cost, of, the quality of life, well, what does that mean? Uh, we have a low cost of, live, this is in comparison to Tokyo, perhaps Osaka as well too, but the cost of living basically is lower. Lower rent is a big thing. The city itself is not so big and it's compact, so people travel less. They travel less to commute. And um, so again, I, I will come back to the conclusion, but you know, uh, they're spending less money, the costs are lower, and they have more free time. So this is a key thing that, that um, contributes to a, um, a uh, higher or a good quality of life. And it's not Inaka. Uh, no, some people think of Fukuoka. Must, it's not Tokyo. It's not Osa. It must be Inaka. It's not Inaka. Um, the city has uh, big city amenities, Dome Stadium, you know, subways, um, Kabuki Theater, uh, with the Sumo Terminal, uh, Kyushu Basho, oh, we have all, all the sort of big ticket sort of items, concerts. Here, my slide's not moving. Oh. oh, okay, it's gone ahead here. Um, but culture and amusement, uh, we have, it's just got a lot of sophistication. It, it's a city of now 1.6 million people. And uh, yeah, it's just got a lot of the amenities. Uh, we also have a lot of nature. Uh, near, really excellent uh, nature, just like Hokkaido does as well, too. Great mountains and forests and beaches. Uh, another special sort of thing about our city is um, young population. Uh, statistically, there's a young population, a lot of universities. For universities, I think it ranks in, this would be rated to population, but third behind Tokyo and Kyoto, the number of, of universities and students. And the growing population is one of the few cities in all of Japan that actually is experiencing a growth in population. And the food is good too. And everyone will say that their city has the best food. But one thing you can say about Fukuoka is that the way that the proximity to the rest of Kyushu um, is such that uh, actually the trans the time it takes to deliver food either from ports or, or farms. So, far. so this will go on and on, but um, it's uh, this is a bit that we have our floods and we have some problems down here at typhoons, but basically some people think it's a, a safer place to, um, to be. Uh, in terms of natural disasters. And uh, there's an openness to newcomers and a very tolerant sun. Oh, one other thing is the very, the, a warm, a longer warm season to some people, that's really good. They like to be outdoors a lot and without the clothing and longer daylight. This is definitely a fact is we have more daylight per day uh, down south than in Tokyo or, or, or certainly Sapporo for that matter. So if you want to see more in, in your life. Uh, for business, um, there are some compelling um, benefits to being down for Fukuoka. Again, it's lower cost of land and labor. And my slide is not moving. Again, excellent transportation, port, rail, road, rail. We have that test marketing. This is something a lot of people don't know, but some companies such as Costco, they opened their first warehouse in Fukuoka. Why? Because one thing, actually the cost of the land and, and Virgin, Virgin uh, Cinemas, this is talking about. Um, also, it's a place where you can buy uh, the advertising for the whole area. You can afford to do that. Whereas Tokyo, that'd be pretty expensive. If you want to test a business out, Fukuoka is represented of, of the rest of Japan to some degree, um, yet it's a market that you can really test business quite well. So Costco continued and has done really well. Virgin Cinema closed after opening in Fukuoka, so I don't know what that means. Um, the, the market itself is the prefecture, 5 million alone in, in Fukuoka, 11 million or so in Kyushu. So it's, it's a big market in a, in a regional market. And again, all the universities, which are good for hiring people and uh, it's a bit of a hedge on Tokyo. You don't have to have all your people, but this gets back to my main point of Fukuoka being a place that offers a nice quality of life. This is a good business uh, reason because if you want to hire people these days, especially knowledge workers, they don't, you know, it's not just working in the cubicle. They want to, you know, what can I do after work and uh, so forth. So our area, this is um, our, our mayor, he's in his third term, he's 47 now, but third term. So he was like under, I think he was 39 when he got in. 
and he's just a very progressive um, politician. He started out as a TV uh, newscaster, and so he's very good at the media. It's just he's young. At 47, again, like he's been in almost like 11 years now. He's uh, uh, still young. But we have things coming up. We have the World Swimming Championships coming up in 2022. We're bidding on G7 Summit for 23. And there's something going on. I don't think I have enough time to talk about it, but uh, Tianjin Big Bang, Hakata Connect, and Fukuoka Smart East, these are um, redevelopment, uh, urban redevelopment uh, projects taking place in Fukuoka, which are, are huge, uh, even by national standards. They're, they're, they're big sort of uh, projects that are going on, and he's a big part of it. Um, we have a startup cafe, startup visas. The first startup visas are actually um, issued from, from Fukuoka under his sort of uh, initiative. And we have something called an engineer, not just startup cafe, but an engineer cafe. And he's a very progressive, very um, high tech savvy uh, a business person. This is just a visual here of what's happening in Tenjin. If you've been to Fukuoka, um, the, uh, the regulation on the height of buildings he has found a way to, to increase that. And therefore, all, a lot of buildings are being rebuilt higher. And these new buildings are modern and uh, larger floor space. So that's why we're getting companies like Google uh, coming down to Fukuoka. Now, I just got a couple more minutes left here. I'm gonna switch gears and I'm gonna admit to you that I don't live in Fukuoka anymore. Um, I live outside Fukuoka. This is what I'm showing this photo here. This is 30 minutes. Well, it depends how you drive, but uh, 30, 40 minutes, this exact photo that I'm showing here from Fukuoka. And this is another of my points is Fukuoka is not just the big city, but the hinterland, the area around Fukuoka is, is really nice. And this is an area called Itoshima, which is uh, where I live. And I live actually in a place really not that different than you're looking at right now. That's where I'm sitting right now. So um, I look at running out of time here. And uh, so I'm just gonna speed up here. But uh, once again, Monocle magazine, that same publication came out with an index about small cities uh, last year in the world. And again, I was surprised, everyone was surprised. Itoshima placed third in the world uh, in the Monocle small city index. It's not even a city as you can see, but um, technically a city. Anyways, um, we have some great articles um, about Itoshima, and it's just uh, a great place to, oh, well, that's where I live. Uh, it's not moving. Yeah, this is another scene. This is closer to where I live. That's my wife there. And uh, yeah, it's just, this is, again, this is 40, this is 40 minutes away from Tenji or Hakata from a bullet train from an international airport, from a dome stadium. This is 40 minutes away. You know, this is also, this is the same beach. This is near our house. That's my wife there. And we're horseback riding, ocean surfing. This is now in a different season. This is the same beach. Again, this is 30, 40 minutes away from, from uh, downtown Fukuoka, Parasail, beach people. That's me on a sup nearby. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I could go on and on as you can probably imagine. And that's what I do, uh, especially on Kyushu Live is talk about all the wonderful uh, places, things to do, and, and people in, in Kyushu. Obviously, I'm a huge fan of it, and um, I hope uh, hope you all come. Well, think again. I, I really enjoyed the opening comments, but talked about how the SCCJ uh, is interested in looking beyond Tokyo, uh, even beyond Osaka, for that matter. Uh, there's some real gems out there, and, and the rest of Japan is is, is big and beautiful, and uh, and warm too, and bright. Anyways, I will uh, wrap things up here and leave some time for questions. And that's it. How do I get out of here? Okay, Nick, thank you so much for a very interesting presentation. I've been to Fukuoka any number of times. And I think I first met Nick over 20 years ago uh, in the Tenjin district. For those of you who have not been to uh, Fukuoka, that is definitely one of the more interesting and livelier parts of the city. And as Nick was saying about the, the younger population, that was my impression too. I saw a lot of younger people, a lot of, a lot of street artists, a lot of people doing different things that uh, kind of reminded me of the, of the areas where young people congregate in other parts of the world, Europe, North America, uh, parts of Asia. So uh, definitely, it's interesting. Um, we're, we'll go, we're going to go into questions in just a moment though, but before that, what I would like to do is to ask our two speakers if they have questions for each other. And in a sense, you're, you're similar. You, you've kind of carved a career out of yourself 
uh, for yourself as a media personality or as a media entrepreneur in two sections, sections of Japan that I think for a lot of uh, people in Tokyo and, and here in the Kansai region are kind of really on the edge of the country. And I think a lot of people, especially uh, our members who are perhaps looking at how to take advantage of remote working now, maybe they're thinking about uh, starting their own blog on where they live or something, or do something else with local media in Japan. Um, they'd be very interested in, in, in hearing uh, your, your different experiences. But I'd like to start off, Delena, do you have a question for Nick on his presentation? Nick, thank you for that presentation. It was really incredible. And uh, your enthusiasm for Fukuoka has made me want to hop on the next plane <laughs> and to come <laughs> visit, especially those white beaches. I'm a Florida girl. I live there, second longest of Sapporo. So, um, gosh, I mean, you presented that so well. But I think the thing I would like to ask you most of all is you know, different regions are, are kind of known for how the people tend to be. Like Osaka is very open and uh, pretty upfront about things. Hokkaido also tends to be a bit of an open-minded place compared to other much more traditional areas. The people in Fukuoka, um, what are they like in general? And what might their attitude towards foreigners be as well? Well, it's an excellent I question. Think. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah, my experience has been very, very positive. Now, I will uh, qualify that is I am obviously a Western, like a Obeijin uh, from, from the West. And I think uh, Japan has, well, a diff different attitudes to people in different areas. But having said that, particularly in Fukuoka, we're the closest to Korea, we're the closest to overseas. Uh, we have in two hours and 15 minutes, you can be actually, that's one. Same thing, people talk about Fukuoka, what's a good thing about living in Fukuoka? You can go for yakiniku lunch and come back uh, to, to Korea. Busan's really close by. We have a lot of uh, Asian um, uh, uh, or origin people in the area. Uh, anyways, what I'm just in summary is, in summary is that they are, they're very uh, open and, and warm to people from all over the world, I would say. Um, I haven't uh, experienced anything different myself, so yeah. Okay. Thanks. And Nick, do you have a question for Delano? Well, when I when she began, um, I didn't realize. Well, later, anyways, my question was: is podcast podcast versus YouTube? Uh, you seem to be focusing more on podcast as opposed to the, the video side. Why did you choose podcast over YouTube channel? Well, actually, uh, they're both done simultaneously. So every time I upload the podcast, it's also uploaded onto YouTube. Uh, however. I tend to be more of a Facebook, social media, or Instagram side where I focus um, my attention, but this is something I'm trying to expand to. So if anyone has advice on one over the other or where to mm. um, put energy into a project for the most reach, I'm very open to those suggestions. Honestly, the podcast just began as a way for me to continue keeping my reporter skills and something to do during the pandemic because um, I wanted to have some kind of portfolio available for whenever these jobs started coming in again. And uh, yeah, so because of the attention from the FCCJ and recently, even though the podcast has been on a hiatus for almost a year, um, I've had a lot of attention lately, which kind of fueled the passion for me to start season two. So I'm currently rebranding to uh, do the project as a solo endeavor. However, my vision from the beginning was once restrictions were lifted, the title is anything goes Hokkaido, I want to be going places and interviewing people on location. So that's part of the uh, current business plan is to upgrade my equipment a little bit. I did almost every single episode recorded on this iPhone 6. Yeah. <laughs> um, some of the audio I did here in my home studio um, where I do music, but a lot of it was done just off of that. So uh, thanks to the cameraman I worked with recently. I've got a good heads up on mics that are affordable, but also very useful for uh, at least two person interviews. Um, I'm still looking for the right camera, etc. But I'm hoping to launch that early next year, if not sooner. Great, great. Yeah, well, I think uh, keep it simple. Keep it simple. That's worked yes. for me. And uh, yeah, good Same luck here. to you on that. I'd love to talk to you later about your yeah. uh, guided walks.
because that sure. sounds like a great adventure. Okay, we have about 30 minutes left uh, before we get into general questions. And speaking of diversity, we have a very diverse crowd here tonight. Journalists, government officials, business people, teachers, and uh, probably others as well. So before we get to that, though, I'd like to see if my co-chair, uh, Ilgen, has any questions for either of the speakers. Ilgen? Hi, hello again. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, first, I thought, okay, I really want to go see Hokkaido. I'm very ashamed to say I haven't yet been to Hokkaido. Uh, and then I saw Fukuoka. I said, okay, wait a minute. Which one should I do first? So I'm going to do both. Um, soon, um, now that we are all vaccinated and things are moving. Um, really, thank you so much for bringing all that news. Um, as a journalist, I think um, I want to ask a question um, to both of you. Um, now, uh, when you were telling about your own areas, my mind and my eyes um, went to immediately the, the uh, characters, um, the people. Oh, no. Sakamoto Brothers, uh, in, the, in the case of Hokkaido, uh, Toyura Farm, Fred Kaufman, we might actually, he might actually be online tonight. Uh, hello, if he is online. Um, Adrian Camp, all these characters. Um, I'm so interested to know more about them. Um, and of course, Nick, you, you know, you and your lovely wife and, you know, all the people that you met in your 30 years there. Now, my question is, if I were a reporter going to either one of your regions, what kind of story would you point me directly to? You, and would you say to me, oh, this is a very unique story. You wouldn't find it anywhere else. Go find this person or go look at this problem. Because I know problems are common, but there are also some unique problems or unique concerns um, you know, for your own areas maybe. What kind of stories would each of you uh, point towards in my case? <laughs> Uh, if I may speak. So uh, I actually had a meeting earlier this week with a man from Tasmania, mm -hmm. um, very close to New Zealand, who's been a long-term resident of Hokkaido. He bought a farm in the Hidaka area, um, kind of on the other side of the mountain from where I was filming. Uh, his name is Simon. And he it's his retirement project. It's supposed to be relaxing retirement, but he's working harder than ever and feeling as good as when he was in his 20s, according to his website. Uh, he bought his neighbor's uh, rundown pig farm because uh, it was deeply in debt and there was uh, illness and reasons that they, they couldn't continue. And the whole town is dying, in his words. Um, his vision is to revitalize it as an artisan's town. Um, on his own farm, he uses a type of farming that's common in New Zealand, where they have multiple kinds of animals that are diversifying the biosphere, I guess. Um, so he currently has pigs, sheep, and goats. Um, they're looking to have dairy production from those animals. They already have pork, eggs, uh, honey as well available on their website. And eventually wants to have cows, but we were talking about having people come and do like a couple of weeks, stay on the farm as like a staycation, work on the farm. Um, you know, when the sheep get sheared, spinning your own wool, crocheters club coming, um, having antique furniture, candle makers, all these different things and just really bringing a new livelihood and tourism to the valley there. And I thought that was an excellent idea. Uh, he was discussing narrating a video about a crowdfunding project to revitalize the farm. However, that is maybe secondary to the hope of just getting the word out about the farm in general. Uh, thankfully, they did choose a male narrator, which I thought was a better choice, considering um, Simon's character really should be matched closer than mine. Uh, but I'm branching that into consulting. Uh, the Sakamoto brothers, I actually want to go and spend a couple days with them soon, by the end of the year if possible, and begin writing a book about their company and the area. And um, hopefully we can both use that to promote their tours and business, as well as my endeavors to be a published author. Thank you. Nick? Uh, sure. Okay, uh, in the chat, I'm going to put in a, a link to a, um, just on our website, if you just a, a filter, we do 
profile some people and there's probably 140 foreigners that either I have or somebody has introduced in our, our media over the years. So there's 140, uh, actually mostly foreigners who live in Fukuoka doing something interesting, I suppose. Um, but to your question about what would be something to report on in Fukuoka Kyushu, I would prefer to give that more thought, but something the first thing that comes to mind is uh, just Kyushu as a region. Um, I think what I hear around me is right away we have, we have Fukuoka Prefecture, Saga, Kumoto, Miyazaki, Oita, uh, no, have the, all the islands, Nagasaki and all that. So I think what we see here in the trend is people are talking about one Kyushu or building Kyushu as a more of a region on its own, a united um, identity and building. A lot of people are talking about one Kyushu or Kyushu Island uh, instead of just prefecture, prefecture, battling it out. So for a story idea, I think that'd be kind of interesting. Yeah, the, the, it, it is interesting, isn't it? Because I mean, Hokkaido is all one island, although uh, anybody who's traveled, especially to Lena, would know that Eastern Hokkaido is in some ways many, many very different than Western Hokkaido and Sapporo. And yet Kyushu, you have all these different prefectures and whatnot. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I've always kind of wondered, how, why, why can't Kyushu be, you know, one island, one. you know? Yeah. But, uh, th there you go. That might be interesting. Or even uh, one country. Or yes, yes, exactly, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. There, there, there's a movement in Hokkaido as well, I heard, uh, uh, to, to have Hokkaido be from Japan, yes. So, yeah. but... Um, okay, and uh, I would like to abuse my privilege as uh, co-host as well before we throw the, uh, the, the uh, floor open for questions from our audience. Um, FCCJ, as we said at the beginning, is trying to diversify itself by getting members from not only the Tokyo region, but from other parts of Japan. As bad as coronavirus has been, perhaps the one, perhaps the only good thing that's come out of this is these kinds of Zoom meetings and these kinds of remote meetings are now possible and indeed have become commonplace in ways that we haven't seen before. And although the vast majority of our members are in Tokyo, although FCC will always be a Tokyo club, there's no doubt about that. Nevertheless, I think we really are interested in hearing from people like you in the media, in other, in other parts of the country, how can we at FCCJ attract people like yourself and people who know you and people who support your media endeavors in Hokkaido and Fukuoka. And this time I'd like to start with Nick first and then go to Delana if that's okay. <clears throat> okay, um, thanks Eric for that question. Well, I guess the, uh, you know, come down here, <laughs> come down to spend more time here, uh, get more articles in Japan Times about uh, Kyushu or Fukuoka. Um, yeah, just, just invest uh, more time, I suppose, and attention. Uh, yeah, I, I think that would be a win-win actually. Um, the other thing too, there are some organizations, some things you could uh, participate in. This is one that uh, I think I mentioned or I'm involved with, at least in my bio, I'll, I'll put this in the chat as well too. But there is something called the Fukuoka, Fukuoka International Business Association. And this is a well, really small group. There's about 50, 60 members, but the foreign capitalized company, a hotel, or airline people, or whatever. It's sort of an international um, association that maybe the FCCJ and FIBA, maybe we could welcome if you, some of you guys came down to Fukuoka, we could have a, a meetup or something. I don't know. But uh, yeah, anyways, spend more time here. <laughs> as as kind involved. of a first step to go to as a first members. step yeah yeah I think okay. so excellent okay thank you Delano thank you uh, of course as Nick said come up here <laughs> would be excellent um, however uh, as Nick said in his presentation Fukuo seems to be very compact in many ways at least the city uh, whereas Hokkaido Sapporo is takes an hour and a half to get from one side of the city to the other um, more spread out almost 2 million population here. And the Hokkaido itself is extremely spread out. Um, I think, for example, if the FCG wanted to sponsor something like a podcast that I do or other people that are doing that would certainly get the attention of the foreign crowd um, or just being active in some of the newsletters and things. Um, there's also the Hokkaido Insider newsletter. It's been a long running digital newsletter here by Ken Hartman. Uh, I think, what you're doing right now is a great step in the right direction. So I appreciate that a lot. 
Okay, we have about 20 minutes left and I wanna take questions from the people who came. Um, raise your hand up uh, in the, uh, uh, in, in the uh, <clears throat> uh, screen and, and I will try to click on or un unclick your microphone. But uh, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, tell us who they are addressed to and uh, please try to keep uh, speeches to a minimum if possible. Um, but any, anybody can go ahead, member or non-member. So any questions for our two speakers this evening? So I'm looking through right now. Do I see anybody's hand up? We have a shy audience tonight. Oh. I have one. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, so Nick, you mentioned foreigners take on their local area. That is interesting because that's also what we at the FCCJ get most of the time after a press event, especially on a controversial perhaps issue, we are always approached by the Japanese media uh, and asked question about, so as a foreign journalist or as a foreigner, what do you think about blah, blah, blah? Um, do you get that kind of question? Both of you maybe can answer this. Um, what, what is your opinion about this particular issue? And um, the reason why I'm asking is also because you mentioned, I, I believe it was you, um, this is an English publication. I mean, you guys are broadcasting or writing in English. And um, we had Dalai Lama uh, online <laughs> yesterday at FCCJ. And we didn't ask that specific question, but I know that once uh, somebody from Japan asked him, do you have a message for Japanese people? And he had only one message. He said, learn English. Because you are, <laughs> that's true story. Because uh, Japanese people are actually, um, perhaps in my mind at least, uh, losing out a lot by not knowing what's going on outside Japan. And, and for that reason, actually, they have to learn English. Um, so two questions perhaps here. Uh, your, your own uh, take on their local area. How important is that uh, for, for the people who live in, the, in, in your local area? And also, is English really, uh, are, are Japanese people really um, doing or, 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 or maybe spending more time and more energy to learn actually English? Okay. So. Um, well, a couple of things. Um, I've said a lot of really positive things about Fukuoka. Um, however, one of the criticisms and something I hear from uh, business people in the area, especially um, foreign capitalized companies and international global companies and or a reason why they don't locate in Fukuoka sometimes comes down to lack of English language skills. Hiring people, especially, you know, at the higher, higher levels, uh, those people, they moved to Tokyo from Fukuoka at a young age. So there is a real problem um, in Fukuoka, actually a dearth of um, skilled uh, very fluent English speaking people, they, they leave Fukuoka, unfortunately. So that is a problem. Um, and what's being done about it is, is again, our, our mayor and other people, there are some, there is some movement. Uh, some of the leaders are just the opposite and trying to set the example or make it clear, but you know, that's not easy to do. Um, we get called, or I get called, and, and people are uh, for opinions on everything. You know, it's World Cup, rugby, or whatever. It could be anything. Or, or um, if they'll ask us, do I know someone from Turkey, for example, actually, uh, that, that's, or from Finland, or whatever's happening in the world. So, yes, we get asked, and they are interested in the foreigners' perspective on things, very much so, local media. We're asked that. Um, was there another question? Did no, we. Do they expect you to have a, a different take on their local issues, or are you so Japanized now? I don't know. Uh, oh, fair enough. Well, yeah. no, that's my problem. They expect me to have a different take. Unfortunately, I don't. <laughs> Sometimes I almost feel guilty about it because, uh, you know, with understanding, it's sort of like you understand why things are. And it's no longer foreigners that come here, you know, in the first five years or even 10 years. Um, they'll still be kind of, you know, oh, why is it like that? And for me, and maybe yourself, I think you've been here as, as long, over 30 years, it's like, well, yeah, I get it. 
<laughs> so I have that problem. I have to sometimes to keep my um, uh, gaijin antenna up. I have to deliberately be sensitive to things sometimes. Good, Delaney. Do you hope you want to answer that question as well? Yes, a similar vein in Hokkaido. I mean, this is where I've lived my entire career in Japan, except for five days in Tokyo, five days in Osaka, doing a music tour before I arrived here to live. So I can't say firsthand, but the impression I have is that the quality in Tokyo and Osaka, those bigger city areas in all the fields, in narration, et cetera, you know, is much higher expectation. And I come against this time and time again, again, I love this, everything about Sapporo, but there are some criticisms, I guess. One of those is when I do narrations, um, I often been fighting tooth and nail to have a proper English translation or go into the studio and say, I'm not reading this. It's my voice. I, I have integrity about <laughs> projects. And most of my clients actually bring the scripts to me from the beginning because they've learned they don't need the middle person <laughs> um, at this point. And I'm also teaching at two universities now. And the, the level of... <laughs> indifference is shocking um, for how, how students don't really seem to be interested in learning English or um, showing up uh, for it. However, I'm trying to really take a new approach. Um, one of the universities I have to teach on demand because of the current restrictions. So it's like they tied both hands behind my back and, and my foot as well. Um, the other university is a medical one where I teach radiology students and I'm throwing everything at them to get them engaged. And it's working quite well, but I still feel at this level, I'm teaching them maybe high school level English, not college. So yeah, it's definitely something I hope Japan will step up on one of these days. And um, so many other countries, people are speaking English as a second language quite fluently um, from early education days. So I hope that this will improve in some way soon. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Does that, anybody else uh, have a question? Because I've got one if the, nobody is going to raise their hand and we're running out of time. So if you want to get your question in, now is the time to do it. Uh, okay, well, then actually my question is sort of related to what Ilgen just talked about. Both of you live in cities that are... Um, well, Nick, you said uh, the population of Fukuoka is increasing, and that was a little bit surprising to me, but I know that the population of Sapporo is declining, according to the Hokkaido Shimbun. So as population uh, declines, and uh, you know, as people decide whether or not they want to move out of cities like Tokyo and Osaka into uh, the countryside, say the countryside, or Sapporo and Fukuoka, do you see your role as sort of a local media celebrity, talent, publisher, entrepreneur, changing in the coming years as the population demographics change. Even if uh, the cities aren't getting any bigger, they are certainly getting older. And that may change your own listeners and your own readers and their preferences and, and what they want to see both as news and information and what they want to see in terms of introducing the local region. So if you could just maybe talk about the what you see your own roles in the upcoming years in the future will be. Starting with Delena, if you don't mind. Yeah, of course. So actually, um, in my rebranding for season two of the podcast, I've already changed the Instagram handle from anything goes Hokkaido to anything goes dash Japan. And the underline is not just an Instagram quirk. When we arranged this meeting, I was like, Fukuoka, anything goes Fukuoka, Japan. Anything goes Osaka, Japan. I'd like to expand what I'm doing to not only Hokkaido, but working with people like Nick and maybe doing cross interviews or podcasts and things, um, shows, and just expanding more and more to get that interest of all over Japan. Um, the heart of what I'm doing is that people, the entrepreneurs, the, the people that are trying to build things and create are the side you don't hear about a lot because all the travel is about the places and the food and the sites. And I want to introduce people more and more. So I think it's exponential room to grow. Nick? 
Um, yeah, uh, Eric, that's a really interesting uh, topic you've raised, and uh, it's been on my mind. Uh, I think I'm going to become a real estate agent. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the opportunity in uh, Fukuoka because yeah, the population is growing. What's happening is people from the outlying regions of Kyushu are moving in. They always have young people have been, that's I told you there's lots of universities here. So people, you know, they leave Miyazaki, they come here, they do university. Um, some of them move on to Tokyo, yeah, but some of them will stay in Fukuoka more than go back to Miyazaki, for example. So that, that's been going on for a while. That's that well, it's continuing. But um just what the other thing that's happening is actually companies are relo relocating for the reasons some of them that I put up on the screen. Uh, you know, lower cost, um, the, 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 the uh, staff are, are happier down here. People won't just want to live down here. So there is sort of just a, an increase of, of, of people here anyways. But the interesting thing or the interesting thing I see around me is uh, people retiring or, or slowing down, moving from other parts of Japan who just want to actually, uh, maybe they can continue their business online um, and, and foreigners as well, too. Maybe like they're in translation like that. They don't have to be in Tokyo. I mean, they can go out there in Japan as well, too, but they're discovering the benefits of or attractions of Kyushu or, or Fukuoka. Um, but what I'm also seeing now quite recently, and this is from personal experience, is um, international couples uh, from the States. Uh, often it's the wife is actually from Kyushu and the husband, or they, they've been in California. They, maybe they've done, you know, good careers they've done well they want to have a second base in japan and they're they're looking to Fukuoka and kyushu and i'm getting contacted about that and seriously about real estate you know where could i live and then i talk about itoshima so i literally have you know introducing last week i've interviewed two people to real estate agents and i'm thinking where's where's my commission on this <laughs> <laughs> no so uh seriously is um yeah, no, it's it's interesting. Um, I think that um, you know people, especially creative or uh, knowledge workers or whatever, they're going to move out of of the of the city centers, the big ones. And uh, the good thing about Fukuoka is that it it's not too big of a city. You're not just trading one city for another one. Especially if you live on the on the hinterland or the outside of Fukuoka or other parts of Kyushu you have access. I'm in Shinkansen from Kagoshima. The Shinkansen to Fukuoka is one hour. You know, it's a very, very different environment. But anyways, I hope that answers your question. Yes, as a journalist, I think the most important thing uh, for all Japan-based journalists is access to sources, which is the major reason why Tokyo will continue to be, I think, the main capital. But it also, I think, depends on what type of journalism you are doing. If you need to be at the central government ministries every day to talk to officials like that, then you don't really have a choice. Uh, you've got to be in Tokyo. Um, until the, we, the Japanese government gets to the point where all press conferences are open to all foreign media online. And as Ilgen knows better than I do, we're a long way from that day, I think. So, but on the other hand, if you're doing different types of journalism, maybe photojournalism, maybe video shoots, maybe uh, just uh, things on society or culture or specialized trade media, for example, and you don't have to have that, uh, uh, that ministry official comment to you every single day of the week, then uh, you might want to think about the cost of uh, staying in Tokyo versus the cost of living somewhere else. So that, that's something I know many people at FCCJ uh, had, especially after the 311, uh, after March 11th. We had a number of FCC journalists come to this part of Japan and live uh, for a few weeks, and they were more than happy to stay out of Tokyo as long as they could, but ultimately uh, they had to go back because that's where the sources were. Of course, back then we didn't have remote working, we didn't have Zoom meetings, um, but now maybe uh, things will change. So um, thank you so much. We're about out of time, but uh, I just want to uh, 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 ask Ilgen if she has any thoughts or wrap up comments for our speakers tonight. Well, um, this has been a really good first step, I think. And um, thank you so much, Nick. Thank you so much, Delena. And you, you introduced a whole different, um, I would say, perspective to us, and uh, especially those uh, presentations uh, with pictures. Um, you know, there's so much to explore, as I keep saying, um, just outside of the Tama River in Japan, in Tokyo. Uh, there is a life outside Tokyo. And so um, I think we should keep doing this more often. Uh, hopefully, um, Eric and I am working on this to visit the Kansai area to begin with. But 
definitely, most definitely Fukuoka and uh, Hokkaido and other areas. Um, if you know any other, as you, as Eric, um, Eric was saying, any other personalities uh, in the media who might want to do this sort of thing, another evening perhaps with, I don't know, Okinawa and some other place, we'd love to, we'd love to be able to reach out to them and keep contact with you too as well. So thank you so much for all your um, information and all your insights. Yes, Elgin, as ever, you read my mind and said pretty much exactly what I was going to add. We, we are trying to be geographically diverse. And if uh, not only yourselves, but anybody listening tonight has any suggestions for other uh, media doing things that Nick and Delaney are doing in other parts of Japan, please let us know. Because although we are an FCC, uh, the FCCJ uh, uh, based in Tokyo, we are the foreign correspondent of, of Japan. And our, our members, especially after over a year and a half of being pretty much isolated in Tokyo are probably, especially now, anxious to get out to places like Hokkaido, places like Fukuoka, and other places if they only had media context like Nick and Delaney they could call and talk to and get good advice on. So mm -hmm. with that, I will say thank you. Um, if Delena and Nick, you do find your way to Tokyo, uh, it is the policy of the Diversity Committee to provide you with honorary membership for one year. Um, this unfortunately does not allow you to purchase expensive bottles of wine and charge them to the FCCJ, but it does allow you to use our main bar, our facilities, our excellent library, one of the finest English language libraries, in my opinion, in all of East Asia. So if you do find your way to Tokyo, uh, then uh, please, you can stop off. But thanks so much for uh, joining us. And uh, I Thank at you. least we'll probably uh, see Delena in Sapporo next year uh, want to mm -hmm. visit. And Nick, it's been a long time since I've seen you, but I want to get down to Fukuoka too as soon as possible. Thank you so much. I just want to say I've actually been to the FCCJ in 2019, September. I performed there at the restaurant um, as a jazz singer uh, along with the Jim Butler Quartet. So oh, I've seen the facilities. It's gorgeous. And I look forward to the next chance to come to Tokyo. Yes, please do. <laughs> Nick, last word to you. Yeah, yeah no, I, I haven't been there. And it's something that I, you know, I see on TV. And uh, yeah, no, it's, it's been an honor to participate in this event tonight. And I look forward to actually visiting the FCCJ in person sometime soon. And um, yeah, this is a great opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, just a reminder, this video will be available on the FCCJ YouTube channel in roughly 24 hours from now, hopefully uh, less than that. So you can check our YouTube channel, FCCJ, to get the full video. And we will be writing this up for the December issue of the FCCJ in-house magazine, number one Shimbun, which should be online uh, December 1st, assuming that we can make the deadline, which is not always the case, but we're aiming for December 1st. Thank you all and good night. Thanks for joining us. Take Thank care. You, Take care. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fred, for coming. Thank you.